following breaking news in the Karen Reed murder trial. The judge, attorneys Karen Reed, back in the courtroom. We are going to listen in live as Judge Canoni speaks here. We are hearing that there might be another jury question. They were deadlocked this morning or told the judge they were. And then she went on and told them to go and talk about it a little more. They just had their lunch break. And now we're getting a live look inside the courtroom. O'Keefe's family also there as well. And we're taking a live look at Karen Reed as the judge opens up the question from the jury. Please rise for the jury. All right, Mr. Foreman, I am in receipt of your note. Judge Canoni, despite our rigorous efforts, we continue to find ourselves at an impasse. Our perspectives on the evidence are starkly divided. Some members of the jury firmly believe that the evidence surpasses the burden of proof, establishing the elements of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Conversely, Others find the evidence fails to meet this standard and does not sufficiently establish the necessary elements of the charges. The deep division is not due to a lack of effort or diligence, but rather a sincere adherence to our individual principles and moral convictions. To continue to deliberate would be futile and only serve to force us to compromise these deeply held beliefs. I'm not going to do that to you folks. Your service is complete. I'm declaring a mistrial in this case. I'll be in to see you privately in a few minutes. So thank you so much for your service. Okay. All rise for the court, please. All right, you've been listening in there, a huge development in this trial that has consumed Canton and much of the region. The judge has declared a mistrial in the Karen Reed murder trial. Of course, the jury has come back multiple times telling the judge that they All cannot right, come like to, to a decision. Let's listen in one more time. The our next speaking again now with the jury out of the room. Is. So I'd like to come back sometime maybe the end of July. I understand people have vacation schedules. Can we come in the week of the 21st? That's fine. Is there another day that week? Could you do the 25th or 26th? Um, unfortunately, I think I, I booked a week of additional. Okay, the 22nd and the 24th are not great dates, so. What about the, okay. what about the, uh, the, the 19th and 9th? Is that whole week? No, that week's not good. I'm teaching that I cannot get out of. No, we'll, we'll do the 22nd. We'll go back to All right, the, you've been we'll listening live as the judge, prosecution, and defense try to figure out a new date to come back to court and start figuring out the process of where this goes from here. The judge just declaring a mistrial. You're taking a look at O'Keefe's mom right there, John O'Keefe's mom, obviously emotional. This has been a lot on the community over the last couple months, a long case. But I do want to bring in 7 News legal analyst Tom Hoops. He joins us on the phone. Tom, what are your key takeaways from this? The jury has come to an impasse. They were telling the judge even at the end of last week that they could not make a decision. What do you make of where we stand right now with a mistrial in this case? Well, I think the prosecution has the ball in its court now. It's going to have to decide whether it's going to go forward or not. I'm sure they'll have discussions within the office and with the various law enforcement agencies that, that are participating in this and they'll make a decision one way or another. 
and we're taking a live look in the courtroom right now. Karen Reed hugging her dad just now and then going through the line of her parents. What do you make of the defense side of things here? What do you think they are going to do as they go into this next phase if this case is retried? Well, you know, they're, uh, I mean, I'm sure they're happy today in the sense that it wasn't a guilty verdict and they're unhappy that it wasn't a not guilty verdict. So um, if it's going to get retried, then they're going to have to figure out is there anything that they could do differently or better, um, you know, the next time it comes up. So if they're going to be thinking on their side, it's like a chess match, and the prosecution is going to be thinking about is it going to go forward? And if so, you know, what can they do different the next time? So I think both sides have a lot at stake here, and uh, they're going to put the time and the effort and the energy into trying to figure out different paths on both sides. And, and Tom, for us, some of us, non-legal folks just trying to understand the process here so at the end there where we were listening to them discussing some dates about this end of july week is that a case to just meet once more with the judge prosecution and defense kind of walk me through what the next phases look like and if we'll know if the prosecution wants to retry this case or not yeah uh, so she's putting it on for you know what we would call in the court system a status date that's a let's get together date and tell me mr prosecutor are you going to try the case again and if they are, then she's going to put together a schedule uh, of, you know, when the next trial is going to be and what's going to happen before that. Uh, if they're not going to go forward, then they'll either tell the judge that day or they'll tell, you know, the court file something prior to that date. So, but it's a, things happen when you set a date and put some pressure on. So I think that's what she's doing. She wants to know in pretty short order, three weeks, three weeks in a day whether this is going to go to trial again or, or not. And Tom, you've been listening closely as most of this region has been as we've been going through this trial. Where do you think the jury got hung up here? Or where do you think at least a couple of the people on the jury were split from the others? Is there any way of really knowing that at this point? Well, unless somebody talks who was on the jury, you know, we'll never really know. But uh, it was a... Um, complicated case you know it was 70 plus witnesses there were a ton of exhibits um some people may not have uh, liked pieces that they heard you know about some of the conduct by some of the law enforcement people some people might not have cared so you know it was a kind it was the kind of case that easily could provoke strong feelings on both sides and i think you know you saw that displayed in uh, the way that the, the way the jury uh, split itself up and Tom, in one of the um, earlier discussions we were hearing today, the judge gave them one final ultimatum. Is that typically what we see? They come to deadlock a couple times, and then the judge comes back and says, all right, this is it. You need to make a decision or not. I, I believe it was called the Tui Rodriguez rule. Well, so, so the law is, is that the judge can only give that instruction once. And if they come back uh, and say we're still deadlocked, then, then she's got to declare a mistrial. We had sort of a sort of a mini uh, Tui Rodriguez because she decided that they really weren't deadlocked. They hadn't said they were deadlocked. They'd hardly been deliberating. So it was as though they got one and a half yellow flags instead of just one. So that, that's what you had. You had the one on Friday, the one this morning, and then, and then you had the one this afternoon. Gotcha. And Tom, just trying to understand, too, where this case goes from here. What are some things you think of? Oh, we're taking a live look outside the courthouse right now. There's the defense attorney, Alan Jackson, with Karen Reed with a smile on her face. Let's listen in live. An innocent person. The Commonwealth did their worst. They brought the weight of the state based on spurious charges, based on compromised investigation and investigators and compromised witnesses. This is what it looks like. And guess what? They failed. They failed miserably, and they'll continue to fail. No matter how long it takes, no matter how long they keep trying, we will not stop fighting. We have no quit. Alan, you're going to stay on? Go ahead. I, I just have two things to say, folks. Number one, I am in awe of the strength and courage of this remarkable client that I've had the privilege of representing since day one. And number two, I want to send a message to all of her supporters out there. Your support was invaluable. We are touched and we ask for your continued support. I'm not from Texas, like my colleague here. Uh, I'm, I'm a Boston kid, but I'll repeat what he said, which is, we ain't got no quit. Thank you. Thank you, guys.
So now as the defense team leaves court, of course, reporters are going to shout out some questions and see if there's any more. But it doesn't seem like they will be taking questions today. Karen Reed, though, with a smile on her face, hugging her lawyer there. We now want to be joined with um, Seven's Jonathan Hall. He has been in court every step of the way over the last couple months. Jonathan, first, I just want your reaction. You have been in that courtroom. What is your reaction to this mistrial that has now been declared? Well, of course, this is a major disappointment uh, for the Commonwealth. Um, it is a bit of a win for Karen Reed because, after all, she's the one with the most jeopardy here. She could be uh, could be going to prison ostensibly if she was found guilty. Um, I had to believe this was going to be on jury. I told just about anybody that would listen. I thought this would be the outcome because when you talk to people who follow the case closely, even members of the media, you get divergent opinions. Like there's definitely reasonable doubt in this case because the injuries don't look like a man that was hit by a car. It looks like a man whose arm was hit by a dog um, with a gas in the back of his head. And then you get other people who say, wait a minute, what about the statements that Karen Reed made when she first showed up? Um, what about the DNA? What about the cell phone data and the black box on the Lexus? So there's a lot on both sides. Um, the opinions were so strongly held that you had to believe this was going to end up being a mistrial. It's very unfortunate because this was expensive. It started in late April. Um, as I looked into the faces of the jurors as they filed out, um, you know, they weren't happy about it. I'm sure there were deep divisions. And it wasn't just 11 and one against one because as you heard in the statement uh, from the um, jury foreman who was dressed up in a shirt and tie today, very businesslike. Uh, there were multiple people who thought there was enough evidence to convict. There were multiple people who thought there was reasonable doubt. And perhaps even some of those people thought that Karen Reed was framed by, by a crooked state police detective. So it's, uh, it's not satisfying to anybody, Rob, let's put it that way. And Jonathan, you were in the courtroom. You have eyes on the jury members as well. What was their facial reactions. I remember just last week we had one of the women who was on the jury crying. I mean, this has been an emotionally taxing thing for them as well over this two-week, pro uh, two-month process, rather. What kind of reaction were you seeing from them and others in the courtroom? Professional, Rob, uh, as they have been throughout these whole uh, two and a half months, uh, they were pretty much stone-faced. Um, I didn't see any tears uh, today. I did see them all file out right by me. I mean, I was literally two or three feet away. And, um, you know, obviously no one's smiling, no one's happy. Um, probably some level of relief inside. They've been away from, from their jobs for, for months and months. So now they get to go back to somewhat of a normal life after this, this case that has really gripped the nation. It has gripped uh, this nation. It's divided Canton, but it's divided the state and it's divided the country because everybody's paying attention. It's just one of those hot-button cases. Jonathan, what was the reaction you were seeing? We obviously had the camera shot showing Karen Reed with a smile on her face as she um, hugged her dad. We're taking a look at that shot again right now. What was the reaction you saw from them, the defense team, inside the courtroom? Well, I mean, I was looking at the jury. I think, I think the defense team um, probably did not do any sort of overt reaction. You might be able to see it better than I can on the camera. Um, but clearly, they were arguing for the so-called dynamite instruction, which is where the judge says, you know, stick by your guns if, in fact, they are so deeply held that it would be against your morals to change them. However, take a look at, at the opinions you had in this case. Look to see whether you might be mistaken, whether the other jurors on the panel might have a point. It's sort of a last-ditch last, last ditch effort, this uh, Tui Rodriguez instruction, as it's called a last-ditch effort to kind of get everybody to come together. But it didn't take long. They went out for lunch. They came back 15 or 20 minutes later uh, after eating their lunch to, to tell the judge they were deadlocked. And these guys are professionals. I mean, they, it sounds weird to say a jury being professional, but they really seemed like they were. They took their job seriously. One woman, according to the, um, the courthouse uh, photographer I was talking to uh, for Court TV, said she went through four notebooks. Um, in this case. They took it seriously and they, they did their jobs. Three jurors had been um, dismissed but they came down to six men and six women who, who took this very, very seriously and unfortunately we, we don't have an outcome and now the judge has set uh, 
another day coming up in July. The judge also, when reading that note, Jonathan, said that the jurors in the note wrote how they were sincere to their convictions. Speaking to, I think what you were just speaking to there is this professionalism, taking this job seriously. Where do you think you've been in that courtroom every day listening to this testimony? What were some of the moments you think may have had some people hung up on agreeing with the prosecution or agreeing with the defense where they all in 12 could not come to a decision here? Well, it's hard to believe that 10 or 12 people are in on a cover-up that are helping Michael Proctor, a, a state police detective who wrote some really nasty text messages about Karen Reed. It's hard to believe that all those people, that some of whom attended a, a birthday party at Brian Albert's house, including young women, 20, 21, 22 years old, um, maybe a little bit older, I think they were 23, attending a birthday party for Brian Albert's son, who was 23. They were all there. And they all testified, no, we never saw John O'Keefe come into the house. Brian Albert, the homeowner, said, I wish he had come in because that would mean he'd be alive today. And yet no one saw him out in the lawn except for one of the young women who was in the car. Said she thought she saw a black blob as she was driven away um, in Jennifer McCabe's um, vehicle. She thought she saw a black blob on the lawn. But basically no one saw him inside. No one saw him outside. The injuries don't match up. Uh, very well with being hit by a car, which the medical examiner uh, even testified to. So whether you're for an acquittal here or you're for a conviction, there is there's some doubt. And when you come right down to it, the legal standard is reasonable doubt. And I think maybe the injuries were reasonable doubt enough for, for many of the jurors. And that doesn't mean that they don't think Karen Reed is guilty. They could possibly think that. But if they have reasonable doubt, then they, they would um, express that with this uh, not guilty, with voting not guilty. And, of course, there were some people who said the injuries could have been from, uh, from a pedestrian strike, and they stuck to their guns. So it would be nice to be a, a fly on the wall, Rob, wouldn't it, inside that jury room for the last five days. We're in the fifth day of deliberations, and we basically don't know what the split was, you know, whether it was six to six or four eight to four. That certainly would be an interesting place to be a fly on the wall. Jonathan, thank you so much. We will be coming back to you shortly, but we do want to get out to Steve Cooper, who is live outside the courthouse right now. Steve, you were just speaking with some of the Karen Reed supporters. What is their reaction? Hundreds have been gathering over just the last few days as they awaited this verdict, but now it's a mistrial. Yeah, Rob, I, we did talk to several of those Karen Reed supporters who, as you mentioned, haven't just been out here over the past couple of days or the past couple of months. We're talking about they've been following this trial every step of the way. And so this afternoon they huddled around their phones, they huddled around anything they could. And when they heard those words from Judge Beverly Canoni about that she was declaring a mistrial, there was a cheer, there were gasps. And there were just a lot of people trying to process all this because, again, keep in mind, these are Karen Reed supporters who expected nothing less here than a quick not guilty verdict. And that is not what happened today. And we don't know the makeup of the jury in terms of what the voting was. And so for a lot of these Karen Reed supporters are still sort of processing all this. They're sort of still behind us here. They've been here all the way along. But I'll tell you what. Uh, today and this afternoon in a heavy rainstorm with thunder, with lightning that is falling here outside the courthouse. We can tell you that so many of these supporters are still sort of processing all this. We asked them if they were frustrated by uh, the jury's decision here and how they ended up coming back into the courtroom after they were given that Tui Rodriguez instruction by the judge late this morning and then just a couple of hours later to come up. But keep in mind, all this is happening on the backdrop of a long holiday weekend that's coming up on Thursday. So for many of the people here last Friday when they suggested and they told the judge that they were deadlocked and that they were hung and she sent them back to work and then said, go home for the weekend, clear your heads for the weekend, come back in today and get back to work and continue those deliberations. So many people sort of playing backseat quarterback here and trying to figure out if last Friday they would have a decision, they were done with this whole thing. Well, they spent the weekend at home. They came back in this morning. Within a couple of hours, they went back to the judge saying that they simply couldn't come up with a unanimous verdict here in this complex case, keep in mind, because you're talking about 650 plus pieces of evidence. You're talking about 75 witnesses over a couple of months. And it's hard to believe that all this began for those jurors back in April. And then they went through May and then they went through June. And here we are turning the page into a new month. 
and just a couple short minutes ago, they went back into the courtroom and told the judge that they couldn't come up with a unanimous verdict here. And certainly all those Karen Reed supporters, many are still here. They said a little while ago they saw her leave. They waved as she left in the SUV. And I just want you to see behind us here what's been going on outside the courthouse here because uh, the police have been out in full force all the way through these deliberations over the past five days. And basically when they heard the jury was coming back and they knew how this whole deal works, that if this jury was coming back and was going to have a, 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 a deadlock here, uh, that that would be the end because obviously the judge we know earlier this morning read that uh, uh, the Tui Rodriguez instruction, which meant that if they came back this time around and said that they were unable to reach a verdict, uh, that the judge, Beverly Canoni, would have no choice but to declare a mistrial. So what you're seeing here is this wall, this bicycle unit uh, from regional police officers from ar around the area that have come together. And really what they're trying to do here is just make sure nothing happens. Uh, you know, uh, emotions are running high here. Um, for people that don't cover courts every day like we do, uh, this is complicated. Uh, this is frustrating for people. But you can see what they've done here is on both ends outside of the front entrance to the Norfolk Superior Court, what they've done is uh, they've closed off the road here. They're sort of encouraging people uh, that, again, we're just outside that court-imposed buffer zone. Uh, and, of course, the rain isn't helping matters now. But to just sort of take a deep breath and calm down, and, of course, it'll be up to the district attorney now to determine whether or not they plan to retry this case or do something else at this point. But that's the latest live outside the courthouse. Steve Cooper, 7 News. Steve Cooper in the pouring rain. Thank you so much for that analysis as well. We are just getting some breaking news from the district attorney, Michael Morrissey. The Commonwealth intends to retry this case. Big breaking news development here. They have now set a conference date of July 22nd. Those were the dates we were hearing about earlier. But again, the Commonwealth intends to retry this case. 7 News legal analyst Tom Hoops rejoins us on the phone here. Tom, your reaction, they are planning to retry this case. Uh, no surprise. I, I, it's hard to be to imagine that a politically, you know, elected district attorney could ever tell the uh, the fellow comrades in law enforcement of a police officer that they weren't going to go back for a second uh, try. So, I, I think that the odds of him saying what he said were 100%. The only question was timing. He didn't waste any time. I think we're what 15 minutes away from the jury being uh, declared hung maybe 30 minutes and he's already out front saying he's going to try it so so we know what's coming next we just don't know when the next uh, trial is going to start and what do you think tom for this next case does this give both teams a chance to reset maybe refocus on some of their uh folks that they had take to the witness stand well yeah i you know I mean, the definition, one of the definitions people say of insanity is doing the same thing over and over when it didn't work. So both sides have got to make some changes. The makeup of the jury might change, but I, I think they're both going to go back to the drawing board and say, what what can we change? What can we do better? Not sure that, you know, the defense has got much more that it can do. question is, can the prosecutor shore up places that they thought they had problems this time? So, but, you know, those are decisions that, trial lawyers on both sides are going to have to make and uh, we'll see we'll know when this case gets retried whether it's the same thing or something different tom thank you we're going to put you on standby for just one second as we recap here at the top of the hour it's three o'clock and we have just learned that the commonwealth intends to retry the karen reed murder trial a mistrial was declared so if you are just joining us you're taking a look in the courtroom after the judge declared that mistrial the jury came back and said they were at an impasse. It was the third time they came back saying they were deadlocked. The judge reading a note from them saying some of the jurors, all of the jurors, were sincere to their convictions. Not too much emotion from them as they left the courtroom, according to Jonathan Hall, who was there. And we've been taking some uh, live phoners with him as well. Oh, John Hall is going to be actually joining us right now. Jonathan, your reaction to this, the Commonwealth intends to retry the case. They're going to do this all over again. Rob, they are. I talked to uh, David Traub, a spokesman for the district attorney's office earlier today. He noted that they uh, filed for an immediate new trial in the Lopes case, uh, a man charged with murdering a police officer, and he had no doubt that there would be an immediate announcement again should this end in a mistrial, so it's really no surprise 
that uh, DA Michael Morrissey, although this is, let's face it, a messy case, right? The police do not look good in this case. Certainly the state police detective Michael Proctor was buried as a witness in this case very deep into the trial, but they're going to go at it again. All the bad stuff is out now, after all, the bad press, the bad PR, the the text messages and, and some of the evidence collection procedures and red solo cups and uh, using a leaf blower in the snow um, to clear away uh, snow from a body. That's all out, like the bad stuff's out now. So I think they feel like uh, for the family, they're gonna do this again. And um, Peggy O'Keefe, you gotta feel for her. She is the mother of uh, John O'Keefe, this uh, Boston police officer who was found dead on a lawn in Canton in late January of 2022. Uh, she was blowing her nose, wiping at her face uh, as this verdict was read. Uh, Paul O'Keefe, who's been the rock, um, this is John's brother, sort of uh, hung his head. Um, I've been in communication too with uh, other friends of John O'Keefe and they said, you know, this was going to be a worry that if this was going to be a mistrial, this would be very, very hard in the family. So we've got to keep uh, keep the family in mind. Uh, certainly, Karen Reed has her supporters. Uh, I saw people whooping and hollering and basically jumping for joy down the street, saying almost as if she had an acquittal. Uh, but this is not over for Karen Reed. Was going to be another trial, and under the state statute involved here, uh, that trial has to begin within one year. So. By this time next year, Karen Reed will be on trial again. Will it be second degree murder? Will it be uh, manslaughter while drunk driving? Will it be leaving the scene of an accident causing personal injury or death? That remains to be seen, but one might think the same three charges would be filed. That's up to the DA, Michael Morrissey, in this case. And Jonathan, you were there when they were first deciding this initial jury. They're going to have to do that all over again. It was a tough process in the first place, but now it seems like a lot of folks in that area really do have a sense of this case. Are there any senses yet about the difficulty that this is going to be, finding a jury who has heard nothing about the Karen Reed case, or at least could set aside any opinions they might have? You know, Rob, uh, that's the thing, right? You hit the nail right on the head there. It's about setting aside your opinions. Uh, Whitey Bulger went on trial. I had the good fortune in a way of covering that one. Everybody had heard of Whitey Bulger. You could not find a juror. Uh, even if you went into uh, a different jurisdiction, if you tried to take it out into Western Massachusetts, um, it, it would be hard to find a juror that hadn't heard of uh, James Whitey Bulger. But the question is, can you set aside whatever you've heard, whatever you've read, and be impartial, and then it's up to the lawyers to decide who can do that. So that'll be the case here. You're right, more people will now uh, have heard of it in the coming year than uh, had heard of it uh, when we did jury selection uh, several months ago. But it's gonna, be, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens, and Tom Hoops brings up a good point. Do they change strategies? Do they, does the witness list change? Um, you know, how do they go about this? Alan Jackson, for one, lives in Los Angeles. He's a busy guy. He's not gonna be able to make the next hearing. Uh, Judge Canoni wanted to get another hearing on the books uh, very quickly. That'll happen in about three weeks. I believe it was July 22nd, she said. Only David Yannetti and Karen Reed will be here for that hearing. Jonathan, I'm not sure if you've heard the sound, but we want to play it one more time for our viewers of when Alan Jackson and Karen Reed left the courthouse along with the defense team. Let's listen to the sound that they spoke just a few minutes ago live here on 7 News. Folks, this is what it looks like when you bring false charges against an innocent person. The Commonwealth did their worst. They brought the weight of the state based on spurious charges, based on compromised investigation and investigators and compromised witnesses. This is what it looks like. And guess what? They failed. They failed miserably and they'll continue to fail. No matter how long it takes, no matter how long they keep trying, we will not stop fighting. We have no quit. Alan, you're gonna stay on? Go ahead. I, I just have two things to say, folks. Number one, I am in awe of the strength and courage of this remarkable client that I've had the privilege of representing since day one. And number two, I want to send a message to all of her supporters out there. Your support was invaluable. We are touched and we ask for your continued support. I'm not from Texas, like my colleague here. Uh, I'm, I'm a Boston kid, but I'll repeat what he said, which is we ain't got no quit. Thank you. Thank you, guys.
They notably did not take any questions there as well after a mistrial was declared in the Karen Reed murder case. They seem like they are ready to fight on. Jonathan, if I could bring you back in here. After listening to that sound, you weren't able to see the video, but Karen Reed hugged um, one of her attorneys there. It seems almost happiness in a sense that this has ended here. What is your takeaway from the sound you just heard from the defense attorneys? Well, there's no doubt. I'm not, not a lawyer, but uh, I think this is going to go down as a victory for Karen Reed because, after all, um, her life was on the line here. She could be the one that would be uh, put away in prison for decades uh, if there was a guilty second-degree uh, verdict, even perhaps a life, um, if there was no possibility of parole uh, given um, by the system at that point. So I think, I think it's a victory for Karen Reed, but it's not a not guilty. So this, this happens again. This nightmare is not over for her. It's not over for the O'Keefe's. And I have no doubt when Alan Jackson says, we don't have any quit in us, um, that's been the case, right? Their whole media strategy was interesting. Like, I've never really been able to throw questions at a defendant after each day of a trial, never mind uh, a defense attorney. That just doesn't happen in this state very often. So their, their strategy was to say, hey, you've done nothing wrong. You hold your head up high. You come into court. You don't hide your face. And you can talk to the media. She even did a, a more extensive interview with one of the networks. So that was an interesting strategy, which changed last week when all of a sudden she had bodyguards. Um, apparently there was an incident with the media where people got too close and she felt like, like people were crushing her. So they changed the whole strategy and now all of a sudden there was no access. And, and they didn't take questions today, which is really different, uh, different for them. So I do note the change in strategy by uh, Alan Jackson, David Yannetti, uh, and Elizabeth Little as well. Jonathan, thank you for your extensive reporting on this. You have been in that courtroom every single day for the last couple months. We appreciate that. And now I do want to bring back in 7 News legal analyst Tom Hoops. Tom, you just heard from the defense attorneys there. They are not going to quit. Obviously, the Commonwealth intends to retry this case. Do you think that media approach, I think that's an interesting point that Jonathan was just making, where they were pretty open to the media. Do you think that's something we'll see in a trial which could be within, within the next year here? Oh, I, I, it's going to be uh, tough to see. I think that it seemed to work well for them uh, as far as they were concerned that, uh, from the beginning until through that point in the trial they switched. Uh, I'd be surprised if, um, you know, they didn't uh, stay the course of the last one, which is not exposure as much. But in a sense, really, uh, you know, they got what they wanted, which is they talked to the media a lot. Um, you know, there are clips of her out there where she's talking. So, you know, if anybody who's going to be a juror, you know, they all say they're not going to look at anything. They all look at stuff. So they'll see her having been out there, having talked, um, and, and having answered questions like uh, she had nothing to hide. So, so I think they accomplished their mission. They don't really have to do much different with her. They'll probably just continue the same approach that they took individually as lawyers, which is, um, uh, well executed, I think, for defense lawyers, you know, from around here, uh, the, the other side of uh, the country. Uh, uh, they're good lawyers. They're doing a good job on that. How it impacts the jury this next time around, that's a whole other question we'll have to see. Tom, my other big question for you, is, especially as it looks like both sides are going to be resetting, refocusing, they have this July 22nd conference date. Is that more just for a reset and a scheduling of the future court dates? Walk us through what that date means. July 22nd, they have set as a conference, a status conference date. Well, you know, it's going to be what the judge wants it to be. But, but it seems to me that if you put yourself in her shoes, um, the district attorney has said we're going to retry it. Um, the defense has said we're not pleading. So she's going to want to put it on court. So she is going to say, um, I've got this particular point in my schedule open. Um, this is what we're going to do it. How much time do you guys need to get ready on both sides? Um, you know, the both sides are going to want the transcripts from this trial. Um, that'll be a little bit of a process. So I would guess that this trial will happen mm, sometime between three months and, and uh, six months from now. Uh, so that both everybody gets the trial transcripts and everybody's got a chance to digest them. But 
in a in a certain way, right? They've already got their strategy. They know what questions they're going to ask on direct. They know what questions they're going to ask on on cross. The only thing that's going to change is, you know, do they call different witnesses? Do they have other work done in between? So, uh, again, I, I don't see any reason this case can't get tried before Christmas, but we'll see. Tom, to another question I have for you as well is looking at the charges she faces. When they go to retry this case, can they change? So, for example, she had a second-degree murder charge, manslaughter while operating under the influence of liquor, and leaving the scene of personal injury and death. Could they change those charges if they go for a, a retrial here, or when they go for the retrial here? Well, it's, they could drop some of them. Um, I, I'd be surprised if there was a re-indictment that they could drop some. I just don't see that politically happening. I mean, this district attorney, 30 minutes after they would clear hung, you know, issued a press statement saying he was going to go back um, and fight this out again. So it's a police officer they indicted um, with these charges, whether or not, you know, the case warranted a second-degree murder. But that's what they indicted on, and I just don't see anybody backing down on it uh, with this. So I think it'll be same charges, same defense lawyers, you know, maybe the same prosecutor, but but uh, something's got to change on one side or the other, uh, because the only other thing that's going to change is the jurors, and you just can't count on it being a different result. So if either side wants a different result, though, I'm sure the defense would be content again with another hung jury prosecution wants a different result it needs to, to make some adjustments tom uh, the statement we got from the district attorney also had a line this is again from michael morrissey first we thank the o'keefe family for their commitment and dedication to this long process they maintain sight of the true core of the case to find justice for john o'keefe do you think that's the primary goal of the district attorney in retrying this there is an officer dead and they believe karen reed is responsible well, so you got to look at what, what's the job of a district attorney. It, uh, the job is to advocate for, for victims. Um, and, you know, and there has to be a case that's got sufficient grounds to bring it forward. That gets layered on top with the fact that it's a law enforcement officer. But um, I, I, I'd be surprised if they didn't think that they had um, not just that case, but that they, you know, they're not going to say think she's guilty. They're advocates, but. I would be surprised if they didn't believe in their case. So I think that's a message to the family and to other law enforcement people that, that were same as you heard the defense lawyer saying, you know, it's an innocent person, da, da, da. That's their counter message to that, which is we're going to fight for justice. Justice is to convict what we believe to be a guilty person. So they're, they're, it wasn't quite tit for tat, but, but that's the sentiment. We're going to fight for you. We're going to fight for victims in the Commonwealth. We're going to fight for victims in Norfolk County. Um, thank you for your analysis. We're going to put you on hold for one second. We're now hearing from Jonathan Hall. O'Keefe's family has just left court. Jonathan, what was the reaction you were hearing from them? They were emotional inside the courtroom. What were you hearing from them outside? I'm afraid they didn't say a thing, Rob. I had been told by a family spokesman that I've been in touch with that Paul O'Keefe, the, uh, the big burly guy in the blue, um, who's John O'Keefe's brother, would have something to say either way at the end of this case. However, they all left without saying a word. Peggy O'Keefe, the mom, John O'Keefe, who attended some of the trial, but not all of it, uh, as Peggy did, and uh, Paul O'Keefe and supporters uh, left. They, they were softly crying and uh, they had difficulty with this because now they know it's not over. There's no justice. They have to go through this whole thing again, um, hearing the trial um, could be over the winter. So we'll see just how long it takes to, to bring this case to fruition once again. But um, Michael Morrissey, the district attorney, did release a statement saying they would be refiling these charges, going after Karen O'Reed. Karen Reed for uh, another prosecution, another trial, another round of jury selection, and months more of testimony. So it's not over, and uh, they know it, and that's difficult for them to take at this point. I'm sure they're, uh, they're disappointed. It wouldn't be a total surprise because this jury sent back uh, a couple of notes, uh, one last week and one this morning, um, saying that they have done their best, they've worked hard, uh, they have deeply held beliefs uh, on both sides of this case, and that they just were not going to come to a compromise. They said that would be uh, 
uh, impossible to reach consensus in this case. So the O'Keefe's have left without making comment. Uh, we have a statement from the district attorney, and we have the uh, defense attorneys uh, saying a couple of things, taking no questions. So it's uh, been short and sweet out here uh, this afternoon, I'm afraid. What do you make of them not really saying anything, Jonathan? I know you said one of, the, one of them did plan to speak no matter what. What do you make of their demeanor as they left court? What do you make of their emotions inside court and then outside? Shaken by this. I mean, they, they had hoped that uh, by coming to court every day, by showing their support, um, that, that there would be a verdict. And in an interesting move, uh, keep in mind, during closing arguments, the prosecutors put two of the prime suspects the defense would like uh, people to believe killed uh, John O'Keefe right in with the family seating area. So Brian Albert and Colin Albert, the young man who, uh, who's in his 20s, two of the people that the defense has hinted could have uh, beaten John O'Keefe to death um, at, a, at a late night party, a drinking party, those people were sitting with the O'Keefe's, so there was no doubt to the jury that the O'Keefe's, who have the most, who have lost the most here, um, do not believe the, the defense argument that there was a fight and that uh, some dirty cops framed Karen Reed. So clearly, um, you know, they had support too, um, and now you know you've got a jury finding some reasonable doubt. At least some some members of the jury finding reasonable doubt. Others saying, look, there's there's no reasonable doubt here. Uh, I don't have doubt. I believe Karen Reed was guilty. So it'd be interesting to know the breakdown on that jury. Jonathan, thank you. And I'm sure you will find out if we are able to. You have been in that courtroom every day, keeping us posted on everything that was going on. I now want to get out to uh, 7 Steve Cooper. He has been outside the courthouse. He was there for Alan Jackson's quick remarks afterwards, also talking with supporters. Steve, it seems like supporters were staying there. Rain or shine? Yeah, literally rain today and thunder and lightning and everything else. And police are now open up the road outside of the courthouse here that they had shut down right after Judge Beverly can only de declared that mistrial this afternoon just to keep everybody safe, make sure there are no problems inside the courtroom, inside the courthouse or outside the courthouse on the grounds. And there was heavy security, obviously, throughout the whole trial, but it really amped up over the past few days during this five days of deliberations and then really from Friday when we first got word from those jurors that they were deadlocked, that they were hung and they were sent back to continue their deliberations. But outside in Camp Karen here, which it quickly became known as, that was sort of outside that buffer zone, that court imposed buffer zone. They had their pink on, they had their shirts on, they had their pom-poms and everything, and there would be cheers during their day as new developments would happen. And then, of course, uh, they erupted in cheers this afternoon when they heard about this hung jury and the fact that uh, Karen Reed was not found guilty. Uh, they said at this point uh, they will be back every step of the way. There was a little bit of frustration, obviously. And keep in mind that many of her, her supporters, unlike those of us who do cover the courts and do cover trials, for many of these people, this was their first experience of all this. And, of course, now they're hearing it won't be their last experience because they do intend to come back. Now, we're also hearing, you heard the district attorney say that they do intend to retry this case, but there are a number of moving parts here because we are hearing things like there is a possibility that they could look for a change of venue. They could move this trial somewhere else in the state. They could bring in jurors from an, another county, which is something that they did in the Chesna case. Uh, Emanuel Lopes was on trial this time last year, and a jury came back, and they were deadlocked. It was a mistrial again. District Attorney Morrissey moved to try Emanuel Lopes again, and he did that about six months later, and it was following that trial, that second trial that uh, put the family members of the police officer through a uh, draining trial, draining deliberations, that that jury returned a guilty verdict. So clearly this is something that Beverly Canoni, the judge here, is familiar with. She just went through this whole process of back-to-back -back trials in the same case. The district attorney says they're going to do it again. But again, right now, many of those Karen Reed supporters, it's probably worth noting uh, that just yesterday there was a clash between Karen Reed supporters and supporters of John O'Keefe who had come out here and they needed the police sort of to separate them. Actually, that was last Friday. Uh, there was a lot of tension uh, in the air, but police were here and they were here also today to make sure that there were no problems and there were no problems. Police are now come and gone from the scene here, from the courthouse. And of course, those Karen Reed supporters tell us that they do intend to be back 
and they will be there every step of the way. And so this is a chance for everybody to sort of hit that reset button. The question right now is what on earth is everybody intending to do, not just tomorrow and the next day and heading into the 4th of July, uh, but what they plan to do now because there was so much focus on this one case not just here in Dedham, not just in the county, not just in Massachusetts and New England, but really all across the country and around the world as well. So this is going to give everybody a chance to sort of process what happened over the past few months, a chance to sort of settle in and figure out where they go from here. And that's something that all those people in pink that were here for so many days say they intend to do, Rob. Steve, and speaking to that point, I remember when I was out there just last week, I was talking with a German news crew to give you a sense of just how big this case has gotten. It's getting international attention. One thing of note, too, Steve, those barriers that are behind you, those recently came in recent days as we were awaiting this. Give me a sense on the police side of things, how they were trying to keep folks safe outside of court, as well as taking Karen Reed a different direction than they were even doing before. Right, so the bottom line was, and it really came from the judge many weeks ago when she put out an order to set up this buffer zone because she really wanted a clean trial, and, and, and they got a clean trial for the most part. The jurors came in, they were bussed in from another location, um, they were brought in from a back location, a back door, and they were really shielded from what was happening outside this buffer zone here that was set up by Judge Canoni. And with that buffer zone, what you had was state police and Dedham police on the outside. You had an army of court officers obviously inside uh, making sure that whoever was getting into the courthouse went through a metal detector and there were no problems inside the courthouse. But they really wanted to make sure that nobody had a chance to get near those jurors. And just over the past five days with the lengthy deliberations that were going on hour after hour after hour, and only today when it started to rain, it has been warm out here. It's the start of the summer. People have been coming out here. And just over those past few days, as you mentioned, uh, they made sure that the Reed uh, and, and legal team and the defendant, and they also made sure that the O'Keefe family, as they came and went from the courthouse to their separate locations, that it all happened safely. And then today, um, clearly what happened this morning when the judge had to read that Tui Rodriguez instruction, that that charge to them about this was the, you know, the last chance, the best effort for them to come up with a verdict. And everybody knew at that point that the next time that they came back into the courtroom with a question or perhaps with a verdict, and again, today it was with they had another question or they had a, a note for the judge saying that they couldn't come to a unanimous verdict. It was at that point that Judge Canoni had no choice but to declare a mistrial, just like she did in the Lopes case one year ago. And it was at that point that police moved into position here. These barricades, these metal barriers were already here, but they quickly uh, moved into position. They had an obvious plan in place. And I had been told earlier on uh, there were multiple levels of uh, police uh, in, in this perimeter and outside the perimeter to make sure that whatever the reaction was to what the jury said uh, wouldn't cause any problems out here. And I have to tell you, in the middle of this all today, just before noontime, a, a prisoner uh, just across the street at Dedham District Court somehow managed to escape custody. And he actually came running down the sidewalk here, creating a pretty chaotic scene, but it was in the couple minutes that police located that suspect and brought him back into custody. But it created a pretty chaotic moment out here, and then things calmed down a little bit. And then, of course, a couple of hours later, Police moved into position. They made sure that Karen Reed supporters stayed in that buffer zone. No one was getting any closer. Uh, and then, of course, they all learned that the uh, Karen Reed, the defendant, and her legal team had left the area. And, uh, you know, unlike other times here, she would walk right down the sidewalk here. She'd wave to her supporters. She'd stop. She'd speak to us. Her legal team would speak to us. But that stuff all went out the window a couple of days ago. And this was all about security and to make sure that the jurors who had just really carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders for so many weeks and then the past five days could leave here safely no matter what they said and what their determination was and then of course the judge declaring the mistrial just a short time ago rob steve cooper alive outside the courthouse thank you for that reporting and hearing from her supporters i do want to now bring back in seven news legal analyst tom hoops and Tom, for viewers who might just be joining us now, District Attorney plans to retry the Karen Reed case. You were estimating we could see something between three and six months from now when we could see a whole new trial. Can you walk us through what that might look like that would put us just around the holidays? Well, it would. And so, you know, she, 
July 22, you know, she's going to, you know, more as a formality than anything, because the district attorney's already said he's going to retry the case. It's going to say, you know, Mr. District Attorney, your assistant district attorney, are we going to trial? And he's going to stand up and say, yes, we are. And, you know, so she's going to say, when are we when are we scheduling this for? And then work backwards from there. In other words, she's going to pick the trial date and then see if there's any interim steps that's left over, though much of that was taken care of during the first trial. So it's going to be a question of what's her schedule and what, what are the schedules of the other two. Um, the only thing that could hang it up is uh, getting transcripts because everybody's going to be entitled to transcripts and the opportunity to review it. But I would think, depending on the court report, that that could be done, you know, in a month or two. And she was pushing it the last time, so I think she's going to push it this time. So could be before Christmas, might be just after Christmas. Um, you know, she might not want to interfere with people's Christmas vacation, but uh, you could try this case in three to six months. I don't think she's going to let it go any longer than, say, the first week in January. So that's, that's what I would anticipate. But she's the one who's uh, driving the ship. Tom, thank you. And now I'm joined with Jadion Thompson here at the Anchor Desk. Jadion, a big day for this case. I mean, it just floors you, right? I mean, we've been just waiting on the edges of our seat. And Tom, I know you're still on the line. I wanted to ask you, uh, this has just garnered so much attention and it's been wildly polarizing. And we've watched the defense and the prosecution lay out these extensive cases over uh, almost a two month period. I'm curious if you think that Karen Reed should have taken the stand. Do we still have Tom? Maybe we don't still have Tom. Oh, we lost Tom. Okay, we'll get back to Tom on that question as we continue with our coverage here on the mistrial of Karen Reed. And Rob, I did want to uh, bring, oh, we have Jonathan Hall now. Let's go to Jonathan Hall. Jonathan, you were covering this story for us extensively, and I even watched all of your recaps, very helpful, every single day, unpacking everything that happened in the case. You know it inside and out. Uh, let me ask you, I was going to ask our legal analyst, Tom Hoots, but in, you've gotten to know all of the players here. Do you think they should have had Karen Reed take the stand? We asked Karen Reed if she'd like to take the stand, and she said absolutely. She said, I want to fill in some of the holes. Uh, she felt that she had been framed by the police, and she wanted to expound upon that. But she said, hey, bottom line, it is up to my defense team. So clearly, Alan Jackson, this defense attorney uh, from Los Angeles, uh, was in charge here and made the call that it would do Karen Reed more harm than good for her to take the stand because after all you can get your story out on the defense side but once they're done with questions you open the door to a cross-examination a tough cross-examination from Adam, Adam Lally the prosecutor in this case so bottom line was they decided no um, I'm guessing that if Tom Hoops were with us right now, he would say that he probably would not have put Karen Reed on the stand either, uh, given some of the testimony in this case about her statements, um, about her phone calls, um, about the movements of her car. Uh, keep in mind, she called uh, John O'Keefe's cell phone, according to testimony, 53 times uh, between about midnight and 6 a.m. on January 29th in the hours where, according to testimony, he was laying, dying in the yard there on Fairview in Canton. So I, I think that decision was probably a pretty easy one for the defense. Um, the truth is, of course, uh, in the pudding, and that's they decided not to put her on the stand. Right, exactly. And Jonathan, in your years of experience covering trials and then really being involved in the trenches of this one, can you just lay out for our viewers right now what it's been like to be in the courtroom and to be around the supporters and around uh, the, the teams, the defense teams and the prosecution teams? Like, this has just been such a polarizing issue and everyone's paying attention to this. It's garnered national attention and then especially there in the town of Canton and beyond. You can't even go out somewhere without hearing someone talk about the case. So what has it been like? for you. Yeah, Jadion, it really has been. It's split Canton, it's split the state, and it's split the country. And in fact, this has been getting some international exposure as well. Uh, this whole scene out here has been kind of a circus, right? You've got these Karen Reed supporters chanting, um, holding up signs, so much so that um, the judge in the case kept them back some 200 feet. So there's this whole buffer zone, there's state police on duty with state police basically on trial, by the way, inside, because keep in mind, um, the defense put the state police on trial by claiming this was all a cover-up 
engineered by the lead detective on the case, the homicide detective, uh, Michael Proctor. Then inside, it was a lot quieter. I mean, there wasn't the chanting, but it was very regimented. There were only 10 spots. We had people waiting outside here. Tony Leoka, thank you, our veteran truck operator, waiting out here for hour after hour, all, all night long. You'd have to put a chair out about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then there was this waiting game. Um, some said that the, the courts should have really issued um, these passes on a rotating basis so there wouldn't be this, this melee out here every day, but that's how it went. And then once you got into the courtroom, it was tiny. Like, I'd walk into the courtroom, you'd immediately turn left, and with your back to a wall, that was the judge's chamber. So she's sitting basically on the other side of a wall. We're waiting for her to come out. Then it was like, everybody step back, step back. We have to be against the wall as Judge Beverly Canoni came by. Seated directly in front of us was the O'Keefe family, and then on the other side um, was the Reed family, and then the jury uh, in front of the court TV camera. So a tiny courtroom necessitated by a change because the defense objected to the larger courtroom layout. They didn't like how the jury box, um, partially a few jurors, uh, could not directly see the faces of the witnesses. So. I think maybe the judge called their bluff because they said, hey, this isn't fair, this isn't right, um, this could be an opportunity for appeal for us. And she said, okay, we'll move across the hall to a tiny courtroom where the, the public wouldn't be allowed in. So there were no Karen Reed supporters at all in the in courtroom 25 where we eventually had, had this case. But yeah, it's been, um, you know, I covered some big ones. I covered the Louise Woodward case, those uh, with a little gray hair. I might remember that one in the 90s. I covered uh, Morty Bulger and some other big cases. but. This one has been truly unique, uh, Jody on and Rob, back to you. Jonathan, thank you so much for your extensive reporting. You have kept us posted these last few months as we've all followed this case ever so closely. But to give you kind of a recap of today, a pretty monumental day at that Dedham courthouse, the judge ruling a mistrial in this case, declaring a mistrial in the Karen Reed murder trial. We are learning that the jury was deadlocked. We learned that last week, but the judge said, all right, take the weekend, we'll come back, we'll try to regroup and they just could not come to a decision, a unanimous decision. So we now are hearing from the district attorney that they plan to retry this case. Our legal analyst believes that could happen anywhere around Christmas time, but again, no definitive time frame just yet. They have a hearing set for the end of July to really reset both the sides of the prosecution as well as defense meeting with the judge to try to figure out where this goes from here, but certainly a huge day, Jodian. Just a, uh, a historical day in this trial now coming to this after the jury said they come to an impasse and as Rob mentioned last week saying they were hung and then the getting time over the weekend coming back today and now this. Uh, the judge issuing those instructions of the Tui Rodriguez um, case saying, you know, this is our final straw. This is all you've got. And then this afternoon coming back with this decision and you're looking there at Karen Reed celebrating, but she will be retried. This is far from over. And the 7 News team will continue to have all of the coverage for you on all the details on what unfolded today. And then, of course, as this continues, it will have to be retried within the calendar year. That's our coverage for you for right now. We will have more team coverage coming up for you on 7 News First at 4 o'clock. We'll send you back to programming, and Rob and I will see you right here at 4.